In this video, we're going to see what the Sony ZV-E10 can do and if it could be a really great main camera for content creators on a budget. I'm going to split this video into three sections, so positives, neutral points and negatives about this camera so that you can decide whether this camera is right for you or not. Now, there are going to be quite a few comparisons to the Sony a7C, which is the camera I'm shooting on right now in this video to the ZV-E10 because I think it's a really great camera for content creators. So I'm going to kind of use this as a little bit of a benchmark to compare the ZV-E10 against. So we're at a place called Harper Rig Reservoir and the reason I've come here is because it's actually usually really windy and it is <laughs> like that just now. So it's a good place for us to test out the microphones on the ZV-E10, the actual inbuilt ones that we'll talk about a little bit later. And it's also just a really cool place to be. So we'll walk around here and let's chat about the ZV-E10. Let's start on a positive note and talk about all the things I like about the ZV-E10. So first of all, it actually offers the same photo and video features as its full frame counterparts, the much more expensive A7C and A7 III. So this is awesome. So basically it shoots 14-bit raw photo files which are really flexible in post editing which I really like and it also shoots 8-bit 4k that's down sampled from 6k up to 25 frames a second if you want the full readout of the sensor or up to 30 frames a second if you're happy with a 1.23 times crop so considering the ZV-E10 comes in at less than half the price of those cameras that's pretty impressive so let's talk about the physical aspects of the ZV-E10 and Sony have managed to keep this really nice and small. It's actually more compact than the a7C, which is already a really small camera. And the main factors that allowed them to keep this as small and compact as it is, is using a smaller battery and also the smaller 24 megapixel crop sensor. This is also a really lightweight camera because it's made of plastic rather than metal. This doesn't really bother me because it still feels really solid in the hand, although it doesn't feel as premium as something like the a7C. Right, so now we're using the autofocus on the ZV-E10 and you can see hopefully it is tracking me and tracking my face pretty well in the frame as I move around. And basically autofocus on this camera is excellent, especially when you're doing talking heads like this. You're talking to the camera and you need it to track you as you speak to the camera or if you want to track an object, for example, you can do the touch tracking feature on there and it just tracks that object really smoothly. The ZV-E10 also has a new feature called product showcase mode that isn't available on the way more expensive A7C and the A7 III. So basically what this does is it prioritizes products that are shown up in front of the camera so that you, if you're doing product review, for example, and you want to show the product on the screen, you can quickly do that. And then when you take it down, it will focus back on your face. So this is a really cool feature it's actually would be really useful for content creators focused around product reviews like myself and when it comes to audio quality the zv10 is actually pretty great it boasts a three capsule directional microphone built in and this little wind cat up here as well so it should give you better audio quality than most inbuilt microphones that you get in cameras these days. However, the ZV-E10 also has a mic jack for if you want to plug in an external microphone such as the Rode Video Micro, and it also has a headphone jack for audio monitoring. The fact that ZV-E10 has a headphone jack at all is a pretty underrated feature for me because this allows you to make sure that your audio levels are always correct. And this along with other features or a lack of other features kind of solidifies that this is a video first camera rather than a photo video hybrid camera. Sony has also included their multi-interface shoe in the ZV-E10 and this is a really great feature because it allows you to use their wireless range of microphones with the ZV-E10. This is something I personally haven't used. I haven't ever used those microphones, but I've heard they're really great products. So it's nice to have the option to be able to use them as well. Now we're gonna do a quick test of the Sony ZV-E10's built-in microphones versus the Sony A7C's built-in microphones versus the Rode Video Micro connected to the ZV-E10 to see how the ZV-E10's built-in microphones stack up. So this is a test of the Sony A7C's built-in microphones. It's very windy, so I doubt this will sound any good. This is a test of the Sony ZV-E10's built-in microphones. It does have the wind muff on top, but it has got quite windy now. But hopefully this would be usable in a vlog setting or in just a video where you've maybe forgotten your other microphone and you still need to record. Now this is a test with the Sony ZV-E10 with the Rode Video Micro on top. So the external microphone connected into the ZV-E10. And this is how it sounds. In terms of usability, there's quite a few things that I really like about the ZV-E10. First of all, I love the fact that you can add a red tally light and turn that on at the front when you're recording, as well as a red border around the screen when you're recording. These are both great features and it means that you won't 
do that perfect take and then realize that you weren't recording because it's super obvious when you are and when you're not. This is another thing that's not available in the a7C. I also really love that it has a fully articulating screen similar to the a7C, which just makes it really easy to use for video shooters. Another feature that video shooters will particularly appreciate is how easy the ZV-10 is to use as a high quality webcam. Basically, you just set it up, you connect it to your computer, and then you can use it either as a webcam for Zoom, for Microsoft Teams, or you can use it connected to OBS, as I actually did to record a tutorial for my work on a bit of software that I train on. This made it really easy. It means you can just connect it up and you can record and you can have a face cam and you have minimal editing after the fact as well. What's particularly great about this is it actually hardly uses any of the ZV-E10's battery while it is connected via USB-C to your computer. So I was recording for about three hours and it actually only lost about three to four percent of the ZV-10's battery over that time, which is great. So you can basically do endless recording if you have it connected to your computer and want to use it as a high quality webcam. And finally, from a usability perspective, I really like that you can access the battery and SD compartment on this camera, even when you have a bottom plate connected. So that's really helpful if you want to change out your battery or change out your SD card while you're in the middle of a shoot. The last positive I want to talk about with this camera is the price. So it retails body only in the UK for £679 or in the US for $699. And for the version with the kit lens, you can get it for £769 or $799. That's already pretty good but it's actually seen a lot of price reductions fairly recently in the last few months, taking it down to under 600 pounds in the UK, which is a really good price. And for context, I'd probably say that in terms of features offered, the closest competitors that either offer the same features or better features, in my opinion, are probably the Canon EOS R10, the Fujifilm XS10, or the Fujifilm X-T30 Mark II. And these all retail for just the body only version at over 800 pounds or over 900 dollars in the us which is way more than this sony zve 10 goes for and we'll come back to this because the zve 10 does actually sacrifice a few features that you personally might want in your camera however you are saving 130 pounds or 200 dollars by buying this over the competitors so you might be okay with those drawbacks right i'm not gonna lie I'm pretty freezing, it's getting pretty dark. I've ran out of time pretty much. So we're gonna actually take it back into the studio to talk about the neutral points and the negatives. So I will see you there. So we're back inside now. We have a warm mug of tea, which is exactly what I needed. And we are chilling. So before we discuss the drawbacks, I want to quickly talk about the neutral points. And these are things that are noteworthy, but don't really have any effect on my overall rating of the camera. Firstly, the ZV-E10 uses relatively small batteries when compared to Sony's full frame cameras and also the a6600. However, for me, this really isn't an issue because number one, the battery life in the ZV-10 definitely isn't bad and actually lasted longer than I expected. And two, having a smaller battery helps keep the size of the camera down. On the ZV-E10, similarly to the smaller ZV-1, you have a bokeh button. And this basically prioritizes the highest aperture possible with the lens you're currently using to try and achieve the blurriest background possible. So this is probably a feature I won't tend to use because I tend to set up my camera manually to get the best picture possible. But if you're new to video creation, this could be a really helpful feature for you. Next, the sensor that Sony have put in this camera is really quite old now and has been used in Sony's APS-C line of cameras for a number of years now. And this is plagued by a few issues mainly the rolling shutter or jello effect, which is absolutely terrible on this camera. And it's particularly noticeable when you're panning or shooting something that is fast moving. However, to counter this, by using an older sensor, Sony have managed to keep the price of this camera right down. So that is why this is a neutral point. This camera also only shoots 8-bit video. Of course, it'd be great to be able to shoot 10-bit video with this, that'd be an excellent feature, but that's not something I'd expect of a camera of this price. For context, the a7C, which is $1,900, also only shoots 8-bit video. Lastly, in terms of neutral points, the ZV-E10 doesn't have any kind of sensor stabilization, but instead opts for Sony's digital active stabilization. In my experience, this is a little bit hit and miss. At wide angles, it works pretty well, but it starts to show some image warping when you zoom in on a lens without stabilization, such as the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter that we're shooting on right now. Also, the active stabilization mode actually adds an additional 1.44 times crop onto your already cropped image meaning that this is kind of pretty much unusable for any situations that require a wide angle. This might be a big negative for you depending on how you want to use this camera, 
but for me, there are a couple of reasons why it's just a neutral point. Firstly, you can pick up lenses from Sony with image stabilization or OSS, including the kit lens for this camera, for relatively cheap. I managed to pick up a used kit lens for only £59. Secondly, I'm going to be using this camera as a B cam for my A7C, so majority of the time this will probably be on a tripod, which means that the downsides of this feature probably won't affect me all that much, but it will be different depending on how you want to use this camera. Before we move on to the negatives, if you have made it this far in the video, then please consider hitting that like button. It really helps me out and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Moving swiftly onto the downsides, I think there are a few things that you need to be aware of before buying this camera to make sure that they're not deal breakers for you. So let's talk about what I don't like about the ZV-E10. I mentioned earlier that the ZV-E10 has technically the same photo and video quality as the much more expensive A7C and A7 III, but there is a reason that they are much more expensive, and this is where the negatives of the ZV-E10 really start to crop up. One big thing for me with this camera that makes it difficult to recommend as a one and done hybrid camera is the fact that it lacks a viewfinder. My A7C has a viewfinder, and while it's lackluster, I really do appreciate using it for photography. This comes back to the fact that the ZV-E10 really is a video first camera. I find myself going to take photos with this camera and then remembering that I don't have a viewfinder to work with and then having to use the screen, which is a lot more difficult and less enjoyable, especially in bright conditions. Coming back to the competitors that I mentioned before, so the Canon EOS R10 and the two Fujifilm cameras, these all have viewfinders, which makes them a much more viable option if you are looking to use your camera for hybrid situations, so shooting photo and video. So let's talk about the screen on the ZV-E10. And I've heard that Sony have really been cleaning up their act in terms of the screens that they put in their cameras, in terms of the a7 IV and the a7S III, which have better screens than predecessors. But this isn't the case with the ZV-E10. You can't really get an accurate gauge of exposure or color using the screen on this camera. And a particular issue of the camera is that things look very overexposed on the camera, and often when you take the file off the camera, and view it on something like your phone, your tablet, or your laptop, the actual image is actually fine and perfectly exposed. So you can't really trust what the camera screen is telling you. However, obviously you can get around this by using things like zebras or your histogram, but I'd still definitely count this as a negative. Coming back to usability now, and there's definitely a few things I need to highlight. One of the things that makes this camera great is the fact it's small and portable, but this definitely comes at the expense of comfort, with the grip being tiny. It's definitely not comfortable to hold for any extended period of time. The ZV-E10 also uses Sony's old menu system, which is notorious for being really clunky and difficult to use and difficult to navigate due to having a million different menus and options. As I've mentioned in previous videos about the A7C, which also uses this menu system, you can actually get around this quite easily by just actually customizing the My Menu feature within this camera, which allows you to put all the settings that you actually use on a daily basis into one little kind of menu, which is great. Another clunky usability feature of the ZV-E10 is the way you switch between photo, video, and s and modes using a small button on the top of the camera. This obviously helps to keep down the vertical footprint of the camera, but it would have been nice to have a dial. And this is because when you are cycling through this, if you press it one too many times and you're on the wrong mode, then you have to cycle through all the modes again to get to the one you want which is just slightly annoying. Finally, in terms of usability, the speaker on this camera is insanely quiet and it's also placed at the bottom of the camera, so it's very difficult to hear. I didn't realize until I started using this camera how much I actually listened back to my clips just quickly to check the audio is okay on my A7C. And the A7C's speaker's okay, it just lets you listen back to it. But on this, I'm actually having to put my ear up to the camera to hear what's actually being said, which is not great. Finally, I have a few comments about the photo and video performance of this camera. Coming back to that terrible rolling shutter performance, that basically means that you can't shoot any fast moving objects without things being unnaturally slanted within the image. And if that's something you want to shoot with this camera, I would just kind of steer clear of it because it won't be very good for you. Secondly, the general lack of image stabilization can become quite an issue if you don't have access to a lens with OSS and you want to shoot handheld video, for example, or you want to shoot photos with a slow shutter speed. You can actually counter the video shooting issue by using Sony's excellent Catalyst Browse software to stabilize your footage in post using the gyro data that is actually stored in the files of the ZV-E10. However, this can add a lot of time onto an already time-heavy editing process. And finally, I noticed a bit of an issue where the camera seems to hunt for focus a little bit more when it's in active stabilization mode. It's not terrible, but it's definitely something to make note of because it could affect some of your shots that you're taking. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. 
But what do I fundamentally think of this camera? And could it be your only camera if you're a content creator on a budget? I think if your main focus is video and you shoot photos here and there, then this could be an excellent investment. And if you own a gimbal and don't tend to shoot that much handheld video, then this could also be quite good for you. However, if you are a true hybrid shooter and you shoot equal amounts of photo and video, then I would honestly steer clear of this camera. It's clear from the way Sony markets this camera and my experience with this camera that it is designed for video first. Additionally, if you're mainly going to be shooting handheld video with your camera, I would honestly recommend that if you can, you put a little bit more budget towards your camera body to get something with in-body image stabilization, such as the A6600 or A7C, because the shooting experience is honestly so much more easy and so much more enjoyable. I honestly understand what Sony are doing here with this camera because it is marketed as an interchangeable lens vlogging camera. However, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for vlogging either, unless you have a lens with optical steady shot. However, through cutting some corners, they have made a really feature-packed little camera that does a lot for the price you pay, and it also manages to undercut the main competitors. But I'll leave it up to you to decide whether this is the right camera for you based on all the things I've said. If you are thinking of picking up the ZV-E10, then I've left the link down in the description right below that subscribe button. And maybe you're looking for a lens to pair it with. Well, you're in luck because I've done a review of the Sigma 18-50mm f2.8, and I definitely recommend that you check that out next. It'll be right here on the screen screen just now. Otherwise, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure and I'll catch you all in the next video. Cheers!